Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, Braden, you mind turning me down just a little bit, please? I may get a little loud, and I don't want anybody looking at me with big wide eyes this morning. Last week, we started on a, uh, on a new series, uh, Pursuing Spiritual Growth. And I actually wrote this sermon series in February and March of last year. And um, I do that a lot. I will start sermons, and sometimes I get finished with them. Sometimes the Lord gives me you know, uh, some wisdom and guidance in adding to those, those sermons and, and building series and that sort of thing. Um, and I did this series last year uh, in the midst of the first set of uh, the first round of chemo. And uh, you may say, well, Pastor Ray, that was sort of an odd time to come up with something like that. Well, as I began to, to evaluate and maybe do an inventory of my own life, uh, I sort of looked at this aspect of we can all stand to grow. If we're not going forward in our spiritual walk, in our walk with the Lord, and growing always, we're going backward. And if we're going backward, we're, we're dying. That's the truth. We should always be progressing. We should always be building our faith. We should always be gaining more and more trust in the Lord as the days go by. And so as I pro approached uh, the surgery uh, and where they removed most of my stomach and then did four more rounds of chemo, uh, I, I finished up this series uh, along with a few others. But my goal this year was to... Uh, I guess encourage all that are here uh, in spiritual growth. And so many of the sermons this year are going to be based on that very thing. Uh, last week we talked about not skimming. We don't want our faith to be a half of an inch deep and five miles wide. We don't. Because the truth is this, is that it may be wide, but if it's not deep, we'll have no foundation to stand on. And we mentioned the very fact that the true foundation that we should stand on is the chief cornerstone, and that chief cornerstone being Jesus Christ. If we stand on anything else in this life and hope to gain wisdom, it will not be godly wisdom. It will not be. If we are looking for wisdom in self-help books and all of these other sorts of things, we're going to be sorely disappointed. And if we're looking for a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, I can tell you you're in the wrong church. We're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in this church. So, look, if you're looking to live your best life now, you need to look forward to living your best life now in eternity. Because that's what Jesus is preparing you for now. He's preparing you for eternity. We're all going to have troubles and trials in this life. They're unavoidable. If you haven't had any up to this point, don't worry, you'll get some. I can promise you. And I think many of us can attest to that sort of thing. You know, and as we looked toward not skimming today, I want to focus on avoiding life. Avoiding life. Far often we do that. We avoid the things in this life that truly matter. The spiritual things, the heavenly things, the things of eternity. So often we are pursuing a new job. We're pursuing a new home. We want a new car. And whatever the case may be, it's easy to chase after the things that are in this world. We're supposed to chase after the things of eternity. We're supposed to build up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not decay. And if we're chasing after things in this world, again, we're going to be disappointed because someone is going to let you down. You're going to let someone down. And whatever you have strived vehemently to obtain in this world will eventually break, need repair, or it will go away entirely. I did this for many years of my life. I chased after the next dollar. I chased after growing a business. And, and, and albeit, even in the midst of that, I said, I love the Lord with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I was in church every Sunday morning. And my wife and I would get in the car, and we would have an argument from the time we got in the car to the time we got to church. We got out of the car, and it was all a bed of roses. 
Everybody thought it was the happy little family. Living the dream, living our best life now. But the problem was, is I was chasing after the world. I focused on growing a business more than I focused on bringing my children up sometimes before God's ways. My family suffered for it, and I suffered for it. And God convicted me of this very fact. You might look like you're doing the right thing, but just looking like you're doing the right thing is not going to bring your family before my throne of grace. And so the Lord began to change my heart all the way to the point that I realized that the career that I had spent a lot of my life learning and growing in is not really where I needed to be. It's never where I wanted to be. But I did that. Um, I had that career as an automotive mechanic to put food on the table. Never enjoyed it. It was always a tremendous amount of anxiety for me. I always struggled. And I, I, I think I was a good mechanic. I did. Um, and I think I was able to fix a lot of things uh, over, the, over the years that I was doing that. But if you don't enjoy what you do, you're always miserable. And you will always feel out of place. When you have, now hear me, when you have a job, and I'm going to say job, when you have a career that you don't have to work a day in your life, you're content because there's a good chance you're walking within God's will for your life no matter where that's at. I was outside of the will of God for a lot of my life and I pursued the wrong things. I pursued the new home, the new car, another boat, and on and on and on. And we could talk about that literally in my life for days. But I want to encourage you that if you're pursuing what's here, it's wrong. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. And then all these things will be given up to you. So wh what do you pursue? There's nothing worse than pursuing the wrong thing. Even if you think you're pursuing it the right way. Proverbs 3 verses 5 through 8 reminds us. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. But all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, a lot of us have got that verse memorized. I know Phil quotes it all the time. So I'm right behind you, Phil. But he quotes it all the time because it's a good reminder. And it's a powerful reminder to me that God is the one who is, is going to make our path straight. It, it, we, we might think we're on the right path and pursuing the right thing. But we're, we're on a road headed to destruction. Now, be, be mindful of what the rest of this passage says. Be not wise in your own eyes. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment for your bones. Look, learning is good. I love to learn. I'm always reading about new things and how to do new things. Uh, I, I have to say that there's a lot of things that are on YouTube that you want to stay away from, vehemently avoid, passionately avoid. But I have to tell you, I've learned how to do some home repairs from YouTube as well. It's an interesting thing. And you can learn a lot of good things, but that's still wisdom that comes from the world. But the, I say that to say this. The best learning that you could ever possibly have is from the Lord. And the only way to do that is to dive into his word. Seek his will and his understanding for your life. And you do that through prayer. And meditating on his word day and night. There's no other way to do that. And look, we need people in our life that can help hold us accountable. That we're walking straight in the Lord. And they're encouraging us and loving good deeds. And they're spurring us on in the very same thing. And look, if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, we're supposed to do the same for others as well. We're not supposed to take, 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 take. But we're supposed to also give, give, give. Because that's what Jesus came to do. He came to serve and not to be served. And so at a point in our lives as we're growing and we're being taught, as we're growing in our discipleship with the Lord, we should understand that we're supposed to give as well. We're supposed to give as well. We must be always willing to listen. And we must always be willing to be corrected. No matter what we're pursuing and how we're pursuing it. Especially when it comes to the things of God. 
And when we are listening and when we're growing, look, that, that proverb says that our bones are going to be refreshed. Our minds will be renewed and our paths will be straight. Look, when we face trials in this life, we must, we got to understand something. We must always remember something. It's because we live in a sol- uh, uh, this fallen, sin-cursed world. It is. We have trouble in this life because we live in a broken world. And there's always burnout. There's always troubles looking in, uh, just on the other side as we turn a corner. Think back to last week. We could say yes to everything. That's the best way in the world to burn out. You need to learn the word no. Now, I don't overuse the word no. Don't say no to everything. But you can't say yes to everything because you'll only be just so good in everything. God wants us to do everything in excellence. And so if we're going to do everything in excellence, we must learn to have a balance in our life so that we can finish everything that we do well. We've got to learn to prioritize our lives. And God must be the number one priority. Look, here's the truth. If you're married, you want your spouse to have a top priority in your life. But the truth is this, and many of you can attest to this. If God is not the number one priority, then far too often your wife is not a priority. Hear me when I say this. If you put your wife or your spouse above God as a priority, now your priorities are skewed. And you can't love your spouse the way that God intends for you to love your spouse and respect your spouse and honor your spouse. All those things that the Apostle Paul talks about. And so when God is first, you're looking for his wisdom, his guidance, and his direction and will for your life. And then your spouse is second. Then your children, your job, ministry, whatever that is, and so on. Do you get the picture here? Look, God doesn't want us to be fearful. He wants us to focus on him first and foremost. He is to take top priority in our life. If he's taking top priority in our life, then he has full control of us. He has full control. There's no arguments that Ray gives on a day-to-day basis that would say, well, God, I've heard what I think you need me to do today, but I think this is a better idea. What do you think? God's will is not up for debate. It's not. And we're supposed to seek him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God gave us a spirit of fear, or not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And if we ever hope to have a spirit with no fear, a spirit full of power, it has to be a spirit of power that's full of grace. And if we ever hope to have love, a love like the Lord, a love that comes from God, like God, to love others as Christ has loved us, then we must have that self-control that comes from God himself. If we're always flying by the seat of our pants, we're moving on to the newest, the latest, greatest thing, and again, we're going to disappoint and we're going to be left disappointed. God's not called you to live in fear, but he's called you to live by his power, by his grace, because his grace is sufficient. You catch the last words in that phrase, in that, in that passage, self-control. It's utterly important that we have self-control. Those who choose not to be led by the Lord are the ones that choose not to have self-control that comes from God. And those who choose not to have self-control that come from God are the ones that are always living in chaos. And I think we've all seen that, and maybe we've actually done that ourselves. Our lives can always be in upheaval. We never know which way to turn. We're saying yes to everything, and we finish nothing. We do nothing. We accomplish nothing, and we always leave people perpetually disappointed. But if we're controlled by God, chances are we're not going to be burnt out. Chances are we're not going to disappoint nearly as much. Chances are we're not going to worry nearly as much. We're not going to be anxious, and so on, and so on, and so on. You get the picture here? If we're avoiding difficult things in life, we're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to be overwhelmed. God doesn't want us to avoid the difficult things in life. He doesn't want us to avoid life. What he wants us to do is hit it head on. But he wants us to hit it head on because he's standing in front of us. He can't walk beside of us. And we most certainly can't outrun God. We're supposed to let him be in front. We're supposed to let him lead. Otherwise, yes, our lives will be out of control. There will be no self-control that comes from God. And those are the kinds of things that lead to the worries, the anxieties, and depression. 
We can't isolate ourselves. Again, we're supposed to spur one another on in love and good deeds. And when we choose to isolate ourselves, we're isolating ourselves from others who can encourage us to hold us accountable in the ways of God. And we potentially run risk of isolating ourselves from God. And when you isolate yourself from God, you'll hear all sorts of hokey things that you will believe is truth. If it's not in the Bible, and somebody tells you, well, God believes thus and so, and you should do thus and so, if it's not in his word, then you better run from the advice that you're getting. I'm just telling you now, there are all sorts of things in this world that will lead you away from God. So be very aware. So what do you pursue? Do you pursue the things of God? Do you pursue the things of the world? Or are you pursuing Jesus Christ? Now look, that doesn't mean you're always going to be happy. But it does mean that you'll always be content. Because you're in the arms of God. You're resting right where you need to be. So, we need to let God have control. We need to let God have control. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says this, Don't be anxious for anything, but with everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Listen, this is, this is your pastor talking. In my life, I've had to learn to let go of not just some of the big things in life. Not just the little things in life, but I've had to learn to let go of all the things in life. Now, hear me when I say this. We give them to God. We lay them down at his feet. And when we ask for direction from him, again, as I said, the worries and the anxieties of life tend to fade away. The things of earth will go strange to them in the light of his marvelous grace. It's an old hymn. You should learn it. I, I, I recite that to myself quite a bit. Just because I remind myself that in the times that I'm trying to be in control of my surroundings and those around me are the times when I'm the most anxious. It's the times when I'm the most anxious. But when I give control over to God and I'm asking for his power and strength to walk through this day, I find that I'm at peace the most. The peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. But it's, I love this word, supplication. That's in Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7. Supplication, humble, a humble request. Some, some translations say petition. Well, you can just go before the court and ask. But I believe with all of our heart, soul, and mind, with well, my heart, soul, and mind, that we should come before God's throne of grace in the most humble of ways. When we come before him with the most humble of ways, then now what we've done is we're saying, God, I relent of everything that I think is best. And I'm asking you, and I will trust only you, and I will follow only you. You know, it's interesting in this world, <clears throat> the latest statistics, the latest numbers that I looked at, about 78% of the world struggles with anxiety and worry. And about 80% struggle with depression. And so there's a lot of anti-anxiety anti medicines and drugs and all these things that, that people tend to lean on. Now, I'm not here this morning to tell you that you shouldn't take those things. What I'm here telling you is, is that far too often I find in my personal life, again, when I'm trying to hold on to the reins are the times that I'm worried. That's the times that I'm worried. And look, let's, let's carry these statistics a little further. There was a point in the world's history, particularly in the United States, when men and women both were living longer. Now, there was a time 40, 40 or so years ago that men tended to live to the average age of about 78 to 85. Well, in the last five to seven years, that number has declined to about 65 to 68. Why has it declined? Well, we live in a broken, defiled world, yes. But there are far too many people who are God with all of their heart. They're not leaning on God's understanding. And they're not leaning on the truths that come from God to sustain them in this life. They're trying to fix everything around them. When all along it's God that must be in control of our lives.
It may seem, seem like it's impossible to do to let God have control, but it's really not. It is a choice. And look, you could say it's a habit. And sure, you could make a habit to let God have control. And they say you can create a habit within 30 days. It takes one day to break it. You must make a personal choice to remember that if you give your life over to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, that you're going to have peace that rules supremely because you have a God who is sovereign and who knows everything in this life. Listen, you can, you can always be thinking about work that's unfinished. This gets on my wife's nerves more than anything. It does. I'm always up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm all, my mind never stops. I'm always thinking about the next thing that I need to be doing. And uh, we, we were trying to watch a movie last night, and it, it really aggravated her. Because I thought, oh, well, you know, I need to run out to the shed real quick. i got to put some stuff back in the shed that I forgot laying outside the garage door. Well, the next thing I know, I'm up at the shed. I've opened the door, and I put the stuff up, and I'm getting ready to shut the door. And she's standing at the back door with her hands on her hips, and she's just looking at me. And then it hit me. Oh, I'm supposed to be spending time with my wife instead of focusing on what I'm supposed to be doing next. You get the picture here. We can't outrun where God wants us to be. And we can't always be moving on to the next thing. If we're walking with the Lord, we're walking where He needs us to be. Because our focus is supposed to be on Him. We won't be overwhelmed. We'll have more positive outcomes and more positive thoughts in our look now in our life now hear me the power of positive thinking doesn't change your life if that were the case I would have never needed stomach surgery to remove most of my stomach because of cancer the power of positive thinking would have taken that cancer away it's God's will that either causes or doesn't cause because God either allows or doesn't allow well, you say, well, Pastor Ray, why did, God, why did God give you cancer? God didn't give me cancer. This negative, broken, sin-cursed, filled world is where that cancer came from. Defect. Defect. God allowed it. And it could be to write sermons like this so that I can learn and encourage you. Does that make sense? And to spur you on. Listen, we always want to sow new seeds. We always want to set new goals. We want to cultivate new ideas in this, in this life, especially if you're a visionary. You're always thinking about how I can change something. How can I improve something? How can I do something different? And I know a lot of you in this room are, are, are a bit of visionary. You really are. But prioritize your vision. And if it doesn't line up with God's will, there's a good chance that that new vision that God's given you for your life just might overwhelm you and send you in a direction that you don't want to be and you'll never have relief, have peace. We're supposed to find peace in the arms of Christ. We're supposed to find rest. Matthew 11, through, uh, Matthew 11 verse 28 says, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. He doesn't say, I'll think about it, or I might. He says, I will give it. It's one of those... 8,000 plus promises that we can find in the Word of God. He said, I'll do it, so I will. And we need to trust that He will actually give us rest. I think it's a beautiful promise. It's one of the greatest promises that we can have from God's Word, that we can actually have peace in this life, in this difficult mess that's around us so many times. Listen, forget about excessive demands that you put on yourself. Don't do that. And those of you, like me, who have spent a lot of your life striving for perfection. Is that you? Do you strive for perfection? Do you strive to make everything just so right that you become more worried about it being right than you, be, than you are about just trusting that it's accomplished? Are you so focused on it being right when you ask someone to help you, are you trying to make sure that they do it exactly the way that you're going to do it? Or are you just going to trust that they're going to do it right and the outcome is proper? Now, in the same token of that, I think that there has to be somewhat of an order. 
In other words, here at the church, and, and those of you who are involved will agree, whether you're teaching Sunday school, you're involved in the jail and prison ministry, or things of that nature, we, as a cumulative group, wherever it is that we volunteer or play a role, whatever we teach, however we teach it, is irrelevant to me. And many of you have heard me say the words, just, to, just get it done. Do it well. But I do care about whether the theology that you teach is that you teach lines up with the church. Does that make sense? The end result should be the same. I don't care how you get there. If you want to run around your elbow three times to get to your thumb, that's up to you. But do it well and do it proper and make sure that your outcome is the same. If you're trusting in the Lord, you're not going to be weary. You're not going to be tired. You're going to find that peace. You're going to find that rest. And, and the truth is this, running around your elbow three times to get to your thumb probably is less likely to happen. You're going to be more productive because you're going to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And look, if you're going to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the only way to make that happen is to cultivate that relationship that you have with God. If you're cultivating, what do you do in a garden? Well, same thing you want to do in your yard when you want the grass to grow. I mentioned this Tuesday morning in our Bible study. The upper part of our backyard was a desert, literally a desert. It had washed so much from the yards behind us that there was no more topsoil. It was sandy soil, and you could dig down a few inches, and then it was just pure clay. Grass doesn't grow on sandy soil. It might take root, and it may spring forth a little, but the first next rain, the first wind, and it gets trampled on a little bit. It can't hold nutrients. It can't grow. So it just dies and blows away. It withers. So there's no root. So what you must do is you must cultivate. You must plow. Till up. As, as I did in the backyard. You till it up. You put nutrients in the soil. Whether it's fertilizer, lime, and all these sorts of things. And then you plant your seed. Well, then you turn it under just a little. After a few days to get that seed to germinate. It stirs it up. It spurs it on. And we must do the same thing. If we're cultivating our relationship with Jesus Christ, our fields are constantly being plowed. Or the weeds are being dug out. And if the weeds are being dug out, the more growth from fruit, for fruits and vegetables can occur. So, we want to cultivate our relationship. We want to build a relationship with our Creator. John 17, 3 says this, And this is eternal life, that they know you, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Eternal life is the only gained acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior. You get what I'm saying here? When we admit our faults and our failures to Him, we find rest for our souls, and it's rest eternal. It absolutely is. Christ moves into your heart, and He takes up residence, and He begins to create something absolutely wonderful. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know that Yahweh is the one true God who is sovereign in the universe, then you will be misled. You'll be planting weeds in your garden, and you will be misled in the path of destruction. Listen, Jesus spoke real plain in everything he said. He spoke in parables, and it confounded the wise because they had chosen to harden their hearts to the truth that he spoke. We talked about this very thing this morning. They knew what God's word said. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, all the teachers of the law, they knew exactly what God's word said. In particular, they knew exactly what the book of Isaiah said about how the Savior, the Messiah of the world would come the first time. He wasn't going to come as a conquering king. He was going to come as a child. For unto us, a child is born. And he was going to ultimately give up his life so that, uh, so that the world, in fact, could live, have eternal life if they so chose. 
That's the facts. And so if that's the case, then our hearts should be geared and directed toward God's will and God's thoughts for our lives. When Christ moves in our hearts and takes up residence, something wonderful happens. There's no way around it. We begin to understand that, yes, I may be in the midst of a trial. I may be in the midst of a hardship in my life. But if I'm pursuing God, then things are still going to end well because I have the promise of eternity. Eternity with my heavenly Father. And when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, he was very clear. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Do you get the picture here? Being born again. And when Nicodemus heard this, he was utterly confused. Can I go back in my mother's womb? No. But you can be born a second time. Born in Christ. Accepting him as the Lord and Savior of your life. Believing that he's the Son of God. Believing that he came to teach, to walk, and to show us love. To show us how we're supposed to live within God's will for our lives. That's the only way. And believing that he ultimately gave up his life, sacrificed his life on a cruel cross that was actually built and meant for us. That's what makes him the suffering servant. Blessed, blessed are those who are persecuted, mocked and made fun of, for the prophets were lied and mocked and made fun of as well. Well, Jesus took that and then some because he went to a cross. He went to a cross of death so that we could have life. He took our place. But the cool thing about Jesus is, is he didn't stay in the grave after they buried him. No, he came back out of the grave. And I love what some translations say about when he came out of the grave. It said the stone was thrown aside. He burst forth from the earth because the earth couldn't hold him. I don't think the stone was rolled away. I don't think it was pushed over. I think that when he started to come out of that grave, that stone went as far as that stone could go. Seals, ropes, chains, and all, nothing could hold it because the Son of God had left the grave for you so that you can have eternity. But that requires a spiritual rebirth. That's the rebirth that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. A spiritual rebirth. Why? So that you don't have to die twice. You die once. You die to self. You die to sin. And you give up your life wholly and fully to the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you're supposed to seek spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. So how do I do this? Meditating on his word day and night. Meditating on his word day and night. King David said, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I may, may, not, may not sin against you, O God. I've hidden your word in my heart. Listen, I've known a lot of people in my life. And there was a point in my life where I'm sure that I was, I'm confident I was the same. You have a lot of knowledge up here about who God is. And even about who he wants you to be. And you're always striving to do the next right thing. Well, how about just being right? How about just being right instead of doing the next right thing? Otherwise, you're just a good deed doer. You're not pursuing God. You're pursuing life. And you're doing life on life's terms instead of doing life on God's terms. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. We must understand that if we're going to have spiritual growth, we've got to give ourselves over submit fully, humbly before God's throne of grace, believing that he is the son of God and he died for the forgiveness of our sins and he ascended to heaven when he was resurrected. And now he sits at the right hand of the father and he waits on his children to come. And so we either leave this world by one of two ways. Either we're here one minute and we're gone the next by death, a physical, the body dies, the soul doesn't. And our soul is carried to heaven. Or we're going to be raptured out. Now, I'm partial. I'm biased. I would much rather be raptured. That's just me. 
But however I leave this world, here's one thing that I know about me. I know that I'm going to be in eternity with my heavenly Father. I don't question it. I never say I hope I'm going to be there. Why? I know. Because I know that Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of my sins. And although I'm not perfect, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. So I have to ask you, have you come to that point in your life today? Have you made a decision to allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Have you accepted faith in who he is by his grace? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not of your own doing. No, I can't save myself. And let, let me be honest with you. The doctors, when they give you a prognosis of, of your health, when you have health concerns or disease or anything like that, they could tell you you've got six months, you've got a year. They don't know. They may think they know. Those doctors don't have a clue. It's God that numbers your days. And it's God that decides when you're going to be in eternity with him. If he chooses for a man to carry cancer until he's 105 and he's diagnosed it when he's 55, then that's God's will. If he chooses to take him home at 56, that's also God's will. We leave those consequences and the circumstances up to God. You can't save yourself. It's only Jesus Christ that can do it. And why and how? Because it's a free gift. Grace, unmerited favor. So we're not a result of works. Hey, being a good deed doer is not going to get you to heaven. You've got to pursue the things of God. If I'm doing good deeds to think that I'm going to get to heaven, then it's because I'm full of pride and I think I can save myself. And I'm always going to be boasting is what the passage says. But we're saved so we shouldn't have to boast because it's God that does the saving. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship. His workmanship. There's no eyes in any of this. You get the picture? Created in Christ Jesus. But when we're saved, we want to do those good things. We never feel like we have to, but it's that we get to. We get to, just like this pray and go that Corey talked about earlier. He was so excited when the new year rolled around. And he said, are we going to do this pray and go again? And I said, well, sure, I'm probably not going to preach any sermons necessarily geared toward pray and go. And he said, but I, I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to go tell people about what Jesus has done for me. Because pray and go is what brought his family to this church. He gets to go and do. And you should feel the very same way. Listen, we've all been given a free gift if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We didn't deserve it. Free gift of eternal life. The question is, are you willing to receive it? Are you willing to receive it? You know, I, I, I've been thinking about this. You know what the best response is for this, for this passage? For this, maybe for this sermon, maybe for this series. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm not exactly where I want to be in my life, but I'm where I am. And I want to be within your will for my life. It's not a comfortable situation. It's not a comfortable circumstance. But God, you've allowed me to be here to grow me, to build my faith and trust in you so that I can be ever closer to you. And I'll never say I hope I'm going to be with you. But I know that I'm going to be. So thank you. Listen. We shouldn't feel the obligation to perform because the truth is, is that there's a lot of people who can just put on a show on Sunday morning. I think probably a lot of us have seen the shows on Sunday morning. The proper response is, thank you, Lord, for another day. I woke up. Now, what do you want me to do with this day? And then, listen. Be still. Be still and know he's God. Listen. And when he directs you where to go, I suggest you do it. It's a, it's a suggestion. I suggest you do it. That's the pastor's words to you. God says, now go and do. 
Go and do whatever it is that you do and do it heartily as unto the Lord. And listen, there's no strings attached to that free gift. So when you offer up that free gift to somebody else, there's no strings either. You get the picture? Grace you've been given, grace you've received, and grace you should give. Grace you should give. There should always be gratitude, praise, and joy to the Lord. No matter where you are in your life. So how do you respond? How do you respond to this point today? You've been given a free gift. And the free gift is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believed in him would never perish but have everlasting life. That's a verse that all of you, I hope, have memorized. It's John 3, 16. But I think it's one of the most powerful verses that speak to God's promises. Who he is and what he did for us. So that we are not condemned. So that we can be brought to eternal life. So, here's your response. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and then purify us from not some, not just a little, not a few, but all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So, what's your appropriate response today? What is it? Is it that, well, you know, I've probably been doing things in my life, even though I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, that I wish I hadn't have done. I've been places and said and done and thought things that I wished I never had. Well, you know, I think we can all, if we're honest with ourselves, could put ourselves in that category. We can. On a daily basis, we all sin and fall short of the glory of the Lord. But the Lord doesn't want us to be condemned any longer. So he asks us to come to his son to be forever forgiven. And we can never be snatched away. We can never be snatched away. So I think the proper response today is, Lord, it's time for me to put my hand in yours. And just like the little child that you have to maybe pull across the street sometimes at the traffic light, let him pull you because he's guiding you. Let him be in front, but don't let go of his hand and by the things of the world. So be very aware. So what's the proper response? I give my heart to Jesus Christ today. I'm asking him to forgive me of my sins. And I'm going to follow his will for my life. And in return, I get a free gift of eternal life. Now, now there's lots of other things we can talk about today. And we'll talk about those things in the next couple of weeks. And I can only scratch the surface. I can. But it's up to you to dive into his word and meditate on it day and night. But this morning I ask, have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? Or have you made him the Lord of your life? Are you seeking his will for your life? Are you letting him lead you and guide you? Look, if you are, praise the Lord. If you're not, let's talk before you leave this building today. We need to talk. Settle it for time and eternity because you're eternity. Period. If you're looking for a good church home, we would love to have you be a part of First Christian Church of Clemens. <clears throat> You've heard your pastor speak this morning to some of, about some of his misgivings. You know why? Because I'm a human being. I'm fallible. I make mistakes every day. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you gladly. He makes plenty of them. But I am forgiven. Listen, it's not a perfect family, but we are a forever family. And we'd love to have you be a part of this forever family of First Christian Church. So, as we stand and as we sing a song of invitation, if you have a need or a burden on your heart, please meet me down front.